Good morning, everybody. I'm just uh, letting uh, all the registered attendees uh, flood in. And as soon as uh, the numbers stabilize, I'll kick off this session uh, properly. So uh, good morning, everybody, to this uh, Happy uh, Lloyd's uh, Bank event on uh, environmental sustainability. The precise title, which you'll uh, remember from when you registered, is From COVID to COP26, What More Can Higher Education Institutions Do to Drive Environmental Sustainability? So it's an event very much about the environment, uh, but also about higher education's particular responsibilities towards the environment. Um, uh, we're delighted uh, to be working with uh, Lloyds Bank on this uh, particular webinar and also on various other uh, projects we're currently doing uh, at HEPI. Just a couple of uh, housekeeping things uh, to start with. Uh, I am Nick Hillman, director of um, HEPI, um, and uh, uh, we are doing this as part of a series of webinars we've been doing ever since COVID hit. Um, like uh, all the others, it's being recorded, um, so it will be made available uh, after the event for people to watch on catch up if they can't be here today. Uh, we are looking for engagement from the audience, so please do uh, use the Q&A function. The chat function is open as well, but I suggest you use the chat function for any technical problems and put your questions in the Q&A because then people can upvote questions and do other clever, clever things. Uh, and we will uh, put uh, the questions to uh, the panelists uh, towards the end of the session um, and do we'll try to get you to ask your own questions we'll try to turn your own mics on if you're happy with that so you can put your own questions to the panelists make it a little bit more interactive um, we've got a stellar list of speakers I think this is a, a you know one of the best lineups of speakers uh, we've ever had for a happy event so I will introduce uh, each speaker as we go uh, through, they'll each get a few minutes at the start to make a few remarks and then we'll open it up uh, for a Q&A. So I'm delighted to say our first speaker is David Willock, who from our uh, the co-host uh, organisation, Lloyds Bank. Um, and David is the Managing Director uh, and Head of Environmental, Social and Governance in the Finance and Structure and Corporate and Institutional Coverage part of uh, Lloyds Bank. I'll let David talk more about his uh, day job and how it relates to our themes this morning. But I'm delighted to say that with David, we're not only getting a representative of banking and finance, we're also getting someone who is a lecturer at UWE uh, and a student as well, a postgraduate student at the University of Cambridge. So we're getting three in one uh, with David. And do read uh, the blog that he wrote uh, for Happy a few days ago, titled Sustainable Development and the UK Higher Education Sector's Opportunity for global leadership, because that very much chimes uh, with our themes uh, this morning. So, uh, David, over to you to make some introductory uh, remarks. Hi, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you, Nick. Um, so, my name is David Willock. Um, as Nick mentioned, I'm Managing Director of ESG Finance at Lloyd's. And I, I'm really pleased to, to be here with you this morning. And as Nick mentioned, I'm primarily a banker, financier, but a master's student at the University of Cambridge on, on the IDBE course, but also a lecturer at the University of West of England. And um, you know, I'd just like to start, you know, the irony of a, of, a, of a banker talking to a vast collective of primarily sustainability academics is not lost on me. However, and I'm certainly deferential in terms of the underlying content here. However, I'm here to give a, a slight update, a, a, an insight into the business and finance community on these important topics. Um, so my hope is that this is a catalyst for ongoing dialogue, because as most of you will know, some of the underlying topics here are, are deeply complicated and will require collaboration across the public and private sector, across academia and business on levels that we've not yet seen before. And, and I think hopefully what you'll take from most of my uh, conversation today is that that door is open both in the finance community, but also the business community. Uh, so my, my ask of you is to, to take advantage of that to uh, to get in touch with me and, and see where we can collaborate. So I'm going to talk about three things very briefly. The first is just to give you a bit of an insight into what, what our clients are up to, uh, a tiny bit about what we're up to, but uh, happy to follow up uh, separately if you want to know more about that. 
And then finally, as a bit of a stimulus, talk about where I see the role of higher education um, in, in this topic. Um, so you know, in terms of the backdrop, very little positivity has come from the COVID um, pandemic. Um, indeed, it's been much pain and suffering, both in the UK context and the global context. Um, but one potential glimmer of hope that we've seen emerge is a growing narrative in the business community around building back better and building back greener. And indeed, a number of business leaders wrote to the uh, Prime Minister uh, seeking to underline some of those underlying drivers of, of recovery and growth and, and, and the potential of uh, sustainability to drive some of that grow, uh, job and, and value creation. Now, this focus on green and sustainability has primarily in a business context been focused on a global surge around net zero commitments and around carbon commitments. However, there is much more deeper, broader disclosure and narrative developing or that has developed. Um, and the backdrop, as most people on the call will know, is a mix actually of societal drivers, regulatory drivers, obviously imperatives, environmental imperatives in some areas, but also disclosure drivers. So there's lots of factors that are behind this global surge. And I do use that, 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 that word surge you know, knowingly. It, it is overwhelming in terms of the, the corporate focus that has pivoted in this area. Uh, and that increasing uh, focus and disclosure is something that we should encourage. Uh, and I'll touch on later on why that is so important and why I think that provides a fertile ground, really, for the higher education sector to help support private business on these topics as thinking evolves. Now, as I've mentioned, to greater or lesser degrees, we've seen clients from the largest to the smallest uh, with varying degrees of, of success and depth fervently get active on the ESG agenda. And it, 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 it's, it's punctuated by loose language, I think, uh, across definitions across what we mean by ESG, what we mean by sustainability, what we mean by sustainable finance. And I think, again, that's a really important area that the higher education can help educate and support private businesses. But disclosure and activity and energy, I think generally is something we should, should be encouraging and we are seeing. So, so what we've done at our end, just to give you a bit of context to respond to that surge and that fervent sort of level of activity is we're uh, setting up an ESG finance team. And it's important to just underline that we're setting up a multidisciplinary team. And what I mean by that is that they're not just bankers move from one area of the bank to another and, hey, presto, uh, yeah, we've got an ESG finance team. We acknowledge that some of these underlying topics are deeply complicated. So we're looking to different areas, different skill sets to bring them to bear in a sort of multidisciplinary environment to help support our clients. Uh, and we think that's really important because as we get through this uh, first wave of uh, increasing focus and, and activity, there's a real requirement for for depth, which we'll come on to in a second around the higher education's uh, role to play in that. So just a little bit about what we, we've been up to, because uh, it's really important. And again, this is a read across for the higher education sector. It, it is to walk the walk as well. And you know, it's one thing uh, having a position or, or attempting to support clients or our stakeholders, but we have to be investing ourselves. So we've trained around 600 colleagues through with the support of the Cambridge Institute for Sustainable Leadership uh, in Sustainable Business Essentials. So we're trying to just increase the level of uh, you know, internal societal awareness, really, of these topics to help us start to embed those in, in all the things that we do. Um, products and lending is something that comes naturally to a bank. So we've, we've increased our requirements uh, there uh, to provide up to five billion of commitment on sustainable products. And, and finally, you know, we've made a number of recent commitments around operational commitments, uh, focusing on uh, prioritizing energy consumption reduction in the nearest term possible, but also focusing on how we shape our financing activities over time uh, in line to a net zero commitment as recently announced. Um, so again, there's a bit of a read across there, I think in terms of the higher education sector, um, increasingly as we're asking other stakeholders to step up. So just leaving you on, on my perspective, uh, perspective really on the higher education and the role it can play. So I, I won't talk about the challenges and opportunities around how you use your funds, uh, how you choose your goods and services partners, how you educate, how you research, how it's funded, because other people are much better placed to talk about that. I, I will, however, just leave you with a, a stimulus really on, on how you partner with business, um, because I, I mentioned a couple of things at the start of my, my, my sort of piece here, that there's an increasing level of disclosure and commitments, which is something that we should be encouraging. There's an increasing level of business focus on ESG. 
However, as all of you, uh, most of you on the call will know, being practitioners in this area, these topics are deeply uh, complicated, they're interlinked, uh, they have a lot of depth, they're multiple periods, they have a interconnectivity. Um, so I think there's a real opportunity now to ride on that wave of, of private focus and private commitment and really help private business move forward in a detailed way to ensure that the good intentions uh, that are coming forward are actually delivered in a, in a robust um, manner, really. Um, so I, I'll just leave you with that stimulus uh, and remind you of my opening statement where you know, my, my door is open on this topic uh, and, and we, we, we deal with the largest companies and institutions across the UK. And what I'm sensing there is a willingness to collaborate with business and academia to help really get get under the skin of some of these targets and commitments and ensure that they are resilient and uh, ambitious moving forward um, so so nick that's that's the end of my section brilliant thank you so much david lots uh, there lots of food for thought and we'll come back to i'm sure in the questions in fact um there's one question already uh directed particularly you david in the q a from simon kemper southampton which we will come back to because now i'm going to turn to kerry facer Professor Kerry Facer, who holds posts, professorships, both in Sweden and here in the UK at Bristol. And Kerry has spent uh, two decades researching the implications for education of social, technological and environmental change. And her CV makes that abundantly clear because she's been the research director of Future Lab, uh, which is a think tank for education and technology. She ran the Beyond Current Horizons Foresight program uh, on education and long-term change for the DFE, the Department for Education. Uh, she's been the Art and Humanities Research Council Leadership Fellow for Connected Communities, uh, and she's also an advisor to the UNESCO 2050 Educational Futures Program. Uh, most uh, importantly of all, uh, from my perspective, to take a parochial uh, view, she's the author of Happy's only ever uh, green book, green paper. Uh, I have to hold it in front of me because it's so green that it doesn't work on the blue background because of the green screen. Uh, do have a look at that. I think uh, Kerry's going to touch on some of the themes uh, in her report uh, in your opening remarks now. Over to you, Kerry. Thanks, Nick. OK, I'll share a screen because um, having spent the last year teaching online, um, I am now in the habit of sharing screens. So I hope you can all see that. Um, I thought I'd start with this image. This is an image from 2016 and the floods at Lancaster University. Um, and it's a great picture. And I think it's just a reminder that if universities don't think of climate change, then climate change will come to the university. Um, so yes, as Nick's mentioned, um, what I'm going to talk about today really is a very brief summary of the, um, of the report that I did for HEPI last year, which I believe is free to download. Um, so the critical issue here is that at present, and I'm focusing here on climate change, not on sustainability more broadly. Um, the issue that we're facing is that we're looking, the IPCC forecasts are pointing at something like you know, three to four degrees uh, warming by 2070. Three degrees warming the last time the planet was that warm, there were uh, camels in the Arctic. So the challenge and the question that I want us to ask today is what role do we want to play as universities in preventing that happening? Um, and I, we have huge resources to be able to do this. So, you know, it's time that we as universities really stepped up. So working out what we do depends on how we define the problem. And we can think about it at three levels. Firstly, we have a headline carbon emissions problem, okay? So the latest figures from uh, Kevin Anderson, Isaac Stoddard and others is that we need 10 to 12% CO2 emissions reductions year on year starting now. So not some kind of distant 2030, 2040 vision, but from now we need to be reducing our emissions 10 to 12% year on year. It's a really tangible goal that we can aim for. However, obviously the problem of climate change is not just about emissions. It's also about the fact that our economic and our social practices are driving those emissions. This is not simply a scientific and a technological matter. And then underneath that, there is a question of worldview. So our beliefs and worldviews underpin destructive economic and social practices. So we can think about it at those three levels. And I think it's at those three levels that universities can make a really clear contribution. 
So at the first level, we're talking about how we reduce emissions from our operations. And we've got loads of examples of things that are going on, places that we can learn from, activities that are really innovative and exciting. So for example, I mean, we could just look um, at, at the home of David Orr, one of the great environmental educators, Oberlin College, which has a commitment to be carbon neutral by 2025. It's implementing solar arrays, community heating, transforming its buildings design, and all of these become subjects for inquiry by the students. So it's not just something that happens in operations separate from teaching and learning. These are in themselves educational practices. But clearly what we want to start seeing is no new university developments that are not zero emissions. And I don't just mean net zero, but zero emissions. We're seeing developments in terms of transport, people shifting to electric fleets, slow and reduced travel. I went on my first train conference uh, a year or so ago, absolutely fantastic experience. Um, we're seeing some really fantastic innovations, UCL bringing in holograms for virtual classrooms. Obviously we're all much better at that these days. We also can see universities taking responsibility for their land. So thinking about how land can be a site for permaculture practices, management for biodiversity, for food production. And finally, we're beginning to see a small number of universities starting to bring in carbon budgets, not just financial budgets, but carbon budgets to their planning. So looking at what the carbon costs of all their activities are. So in terms of emissions reduction, there's loads that we can do at the material level. But let's also think about our role into in this kind of structural level, thinking about the economic and social practices that are driving our emissions. And here we can create the connection with universities as civic universities or as anchor organizations. Um, and we can think about how we're using our own financial assets. Now, clearly we are already seeing a massive move to divest from fossil fuels in terms of university investments. And um, this is happening worldwide and any universities that are not fulfilling this agenda are, are going to need to be answerable very, very soon to their students and to the wider community. We see some great examples. My own university has made the commitment to divest from fossil fuels. You can see St. Anne's in Oxford, Edinburgh is doing it. But possibly even more interestingly is we're starting to see a reinvestment of those funds into socially and ecologically restorative and regenerative practices and Cambridge, for example, is, has just made a statement to this end. We're also seeing universities really playing their role as anchor institutions, the Commonwealth programme um, is a stunning example running in Cleveland and Preston, which supports universities to think about where are our supply chains, where are they coming from, who are we supporting, how do we set up local organizations, for example, as cooperatives and nonprofits to build their local schools to meet gaps in delivery, how do we trace the sustainability of our supplies. And the final element that we can play in terms of being anchor organizations or civic universities is to think of our educational role in terms of a just transition. We are going to need to support large numbers of adults to transition away from high carbon employment. Um, we saw an early example of this last year with the, um, with the pandemic when large numbers of airline staff, for example, uh, became unemployed. And we saw in Sweden a rapid um, reskilling of them to take up a role in um, caring and healthcare facilities. In the renewable energy alone, we're looking at the need for 30,000 graduate level jobs by 2030. So there is going to be a huge opportunity for universities to rethink who are they serving, what's the age group that they're serving, and, and, to, and this is where FE colleges also play a really critical role, and we need to think about this in terms of much older adults as well. And the final area of the kind of defining problem is this question of, you know, what are our world views and beliefs, and arguably the idea that we're humans that can extract anything from the planet with no impact on anybody um, is one of the issues that's really been driving the, the problems that we now find ourselves in. So at the worldview level, universities have a huge role in reframing our research and education towards what's been called the, the great transition, towards a more regenerative, restorative relationship with the planet. And here we can see lots of examples of how universities can play this world. We can see, um, uh, examples of research as practical experimentation with new ways of living in places like Amsterdam, which are drawing on the economist Kate Rayworth's work on donut economics. 
We can see changes in our educational practices so that we're pulling people in from this kind of teaching sustainability as though it's the thing that you add on to thinking about actually, how do you envisage yourself, your future, your life, your work, when you don't think you're just, you know, one of these 1980s masters of the universe that can go out swashbuckling and extract everything you like, but that you might actually be part of uh, a biosphere um, interconnected with other people. And we're also seeing universities taking on their public role, supporting the debates about what a sustainable and equitable world might look like. They're playing a critical role in what we might call the infrastructure of imagination, the creation of a new sort of future. And here you can look at examples like York University Citizens Assembly on climate action. So to summarize, Climate change is happening, it is bad, to quote Kim Nichols' fabulous new book called Under the Sky We Make. We are the generation that needs to act and we've got assets in universities that can do this. We can lead change and we can amplify changes happening elsewhere. We can do it through the material actions on our campuses, we can do it through our role as anchor organizations and through our role as researchers, educators and cultural institutions. Let's do it, thanks very much. Thanks. Uh, thanks so much, Kerry. Um, there's already been a request in the Q&A uh, to make your uh, slides shareable in public. And if you're happy to do that, um, we'd certainly love to put them up on the Happy website after the event. Um, th thank you for that. Um, we'll come back to some of those themes I know in the Q&A. But with no further ado, I'm going to move to Professor Mark Fellows, who uh, is the PVC, the Pro Vice Chancellor for Academic Planning and Resource at the University of Reading. So he's on the management at the University of Reading, but um, <clears throat> he's not the only one of our speakers today whose actual academic discipline uh, is highly related to all the things we're talking about because Mark is a professor of ecology and an expert on urban ecology, uh, urban greening and the interactions between humans and wildlife, among lots of other things. His list of publications runs to 10 pages in quite a small font. So uh, he is uh, definitely the right person to be talking about these issues today. And I hope indeed, Mark, as you know, that uh, once COVID dies down, uh, that you might be the author of our second publication on these uh, topics. Um, over to you, Mark. Great. Thank you uh, very much, Nick, for that introduction. Um, uh, far too flattering, I think. Um, I'm going to follow with something a little bit more personal, uh, that just given Kerry's sort of introduction, which is a, a fantastic overview of where universities are and what they can do. Uh, I thought I'd take a rather different view, and, and actually it does speak to some of the things that she mentioned in there. So about 18 months ago, I became responsible for leading my university's response to the challenge of environmental sustainability. And while Nick was very kind, uh, and I am a professor of ecology, I am absolutely no expert on the mechanisms of sustainability or climate change science or how we influence policy. Um, but I'm very much more engaged with how you lead that sort of change from within an institution. But as I said, this is going to be a little bit more personal. And, and what I do know about is about change and loss and the need to take the long view. Uh, I grew up in the west of Ireland and I heard my last corn crake from my bedroom window, window uh, in the summer of 1981 when I was 12. And this is a species that's been largely lost due to environmental change and agricultural intensification. Um, on the fields where I mapped skylark territories as a, as a teenager, they're now just large housing estates. And over the years as an ecologist and zoologist, I've seen the change in the timing of ecological events due to climate change, the loss of migrant birds, massive insect decline. Uh, and as an academic, I've taught and I have research collaborations in the tropics. So I've seen the destruction of rainforests in Borneo, Madagascar, the Amazon. And what we know is that the world is, that, that is definitely, of course, changing for the worse. And the question is one of how HE can do more to help. Um, and while there are many answers to those questions, I, I'd like to focus on what I think are just two key challenge, uh, challenges. And this really does build on what Kerry was saying earlier. I started with my personal, and the question is, how do we make it personal for those in our communities and networks who have not engaged with the problem, helping them make their own link between their actions and consequent loss? So how do we in uh, HE help make those global challenges personal for them? And for many, especially, you know, I think of my own children, 
issues such as climate change can seem to be a challenge for the distant future so that the links between our decisions today and future outcomes are often discounted. And what we need to do is to put a, a human scale both on what we have lost and what we may yet lose. And of course, COP26 will undoubtedly help bring this to the fore in terms of media attention. But if we want to put a human scale in it, I, I tend to think locally. So Reading received its Royal Charter in 1926. And in that year, both the Queen and David Attenborough were born. And in their lifetimes, we've already seen an increase of around one degree centigrade in mean global temperatures due to anthropogenic climate change. Not far off what COP is trying to, to limit us to a change of, of 1.5 degrees. Now, if that seems too long ago, they're long lived individuals, in my own lifetime, global populations of monitored wild mammals have declined by two thirds. And even more striking for those students who are going to join us this year, they'll have lived through the 10 warmest years on record. And I find that a, a startling, startling fact. And many of you will have seen the climate stripes and, and the climate stripes were produced by Ed Hawkins, who's one of Reading's climatologists. And, 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 and that really provides a simple to absorb stark illustration of how our climate has already changed. And it's really a warning as to how that change will continue. So the question I think is how do we help our communities what, imagine what their world will be like in the 2050s or even when our new students uh, reach David Attenborough's grand age at the end of the century, this is within their lifetimes. We need to stop thinking about this as a generational thing. It's the generations that exist will have to cope with climate change. And it is difficult, of course. Um, first of all, we have to battle shifting baseline syndrome. We simply get used to things as they are and we forget how they were. And then we must personalize the challenge, which I was trying to illustrate at the beginning to help the uncommitted understand how they can play a role in holding not just themselves, but also our governments, business and institutions to account when we need action. And we've seen the effect of that personal level of responsibility over the last year as COVID has changed our collective behaviours to benefit society, so it, it can be done. And HE can address both challenges. You know, universities and college, colleges keep the memory of what we have lost alive and they must bring to life the threats ahead. Universities and colleges need to use their powers as sources of knowledge and learning and as home to global communities to act collectively as agents for global societal change. And to achieve this, we need to both listen to and educate our own and local communities through teaching and engagement, helping to keep the challenge of environmental sustainability to the fore. Many students, of course, are already deeply involved and, and passionate about, about the need to act. And indeed, changes in our own university's investment policy were developed in concert with our student body. But it's not about them, it's about those who are not already committed to the need to change. So providing relevant programmes for all our students, of course, is essential, but helping our staff engage is also key. But we must do this together in partnership, understanding the problems, developing the solutions, using the many perspectives that the university community can bring together to help us make decisions in a time of climate change. Our students will disperse around the world, our staff make a substantial part of our own local communities, and through them we can help bring a shared understanding of environmental sustainability to a wider world. At the same time, universities, of course, have to walk the walk. We heard that earlier. They have significant complex organisations they have to lead by example, and it's a massive challenge. You know, even discounting last year, Reading reduced carbon emissions by over 45% since its baseline year. In the last five years, we've reduced waste by over 40%. Our campus has over 2,000 species recorded. It's, it's immensely biodiverse. And we've done fantastic work on supporting plant-based diets. So we're committed, like many others, to net zero by 2030. Uh, and environmental sustainability is a central pillar of our new university strategy. And that's been key. The focus on sustainability uh, coming to the centre is, is critical. But it's hard work. And it's been hard work doing the easy wins. But what comes next is going to be really difficult. And I think we shouldn't underestimate the cost of that, both in terms of financial costs and resources, but also in terms of changing complicated big organisations. But it's absolutely necessary. So while my first plea in all of this was to how universities and colleges can help everybody develop a sense of this being personal to them, 
because what we do today will not just affect future generations, but our own. But the second is one about how we work together. So I've spoken about how my own university has responded, many other people in the audience and, and here could, could talk about how their institutions have done similar things. Um, and, and of course, we contribute massively in terms of climate change research, as well as teaching and our operations. But around education, I think we'd be much more powerful if we could really come together. You know, that I think COVID as well has shown us that there are universities and colleges both at home and further afield for whom making some of these changes, engaging in new programmes will be more difficult due to their contact, context or capacity. And I think as a sector, what we need to do is acknowledge those differences and see this as a national and global opportunity to work together, benefiting us all. So thank you. And it's back to you, Nick. Thanks very much, uh, Mark. Uh, fantastic. And from that um, really important view at an institutional level, we're going to helicopter out a bit now and hear from uh, my old friend Tony Juniper, uh, who many of you will know. He's been described as the most effective of Britain's eco warriors, as one of the all time eco heroes. He spent uh, over three decades working for change uh, to try and deliver a more sustainable uh, society, a local, national, and international levels. And he's currently chair of Natural England, which is the statutory body working for the conservation and restoration of the natural environment in England. But many of you will know uh, his previous work from WWF uh, as the Prince of Wales's special advisor on international uh, sustainability, or indeed his work uh, when I, th I think I first uh, came aware of your work, Tony, uh, uh, Friends of the Earth. Um, I know, having stood against Tony uh, uh, in mm. an election in 2010, what a formidable campaigner uh, he is. Um, and Tony, we're so grateful uh, to you for doing this. Over to you. Well, thanks very much, Nick. Re really great to see you again and, and a pleasure to be able to share a few thoughts uh, here today. Um, it, it's really quite um, striking, actually, Nick, and you mentioned, you know, the, the years I've been involved with all of this, but it's really striking how quickly uh, we've just moved from a period where many organisations were debating if they were going to do something about these big environmental questions and into a space uh, where now pretty much everybody is talking about what they're going to do and how quickly they're going to do it. So th th this is um, an unusual moment we've arrived in. And, um, you know, it's set against the backdrop of this incredibly pressing set of environmental issues that are now upon us and quite rightly now described as an emergency, a climate change and nature emergency. And of, of course, we've had the science to tell us about that for quite some time at least 30 years, if not longer in some ways, but it's very noticeable now that we are beginning to get our arms around this. Um, what is surprising actually uh, about that is how we are becoming very focused on the action needed at a time of really quite significant economic crisis that's been generated by the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and that juxtaposition is all the more interesting when you look back at the history of environmental challenges and you see pretty much without exception that when there was an economic crisis in the past, the attention on the environmental issues went down. And you saw this after the financial crisis in 2008, 2009, when you saw a very noticeable move away from environmental ambition in order to get the economy fixed. And at the moment, you don't see that. You've got the worst economic crisis ever, makes the financial crisis in that period look actually relatively modest. And yet you've got governments, institutions, the public scientific agencies now very focused on what we're gonna do to drive to net zero very quickly at the same time as reversing the immense damage that is being caused to the natural world. And, and why that might be is an interesting thought. And, you know, probably has got something to do with the fact that the COVID-19 pandemic is itself actually an environmental issue. And we've been warned again for decades uh, by the expert community that actually the risk of pandemics goes up in relation to various uh, trends that are environmentally damaging. Deforestation, that led to the emergence of Ebola. Uh, the bushmeat hunting trade, catching apes to eat, that was the source of HIV 
getting into the human population. Uh, we had SARS in 2004, uh, 2003, 4. Uh, that was linked to the catching of animals to be eaten in restaurants in China. Uh, and then we had the Nipah virus breaking out in the 90s, a very nasty one linked to the transfer of uh, disease between uh, bats and pigs, again linked to deforestation in Malaysia. And now COVID-19, which appears to be linked to the uh, wildlife trade with bats and other animals being kept in stressful conditions in markets with diseases jumping between them and of course on top of that factory farming of chickens and pigs led to two recent flu outbreaks that led to some level of human mortality so one wonders if finally the science and the risk that was being laid out by the science is now being connected to events in the real world and of course there's plenty of other things going on forest fires heat waves uh, extreme events in the form of hurricanes and typhoons causing immense damage and loss of life perhaps we're now into a period where um, the consequences are now beginning to underline the need for urgent action and not a moment too soon do we have time to avert a mass extinction of animals and plants and ecosystem collapse? Never mind the tra transforming of our world with two, three, four degrees of global warming. Well, I don't know the answer to that. It may be that we've already reached the point where some of the damage uh, is now going to be um, unavoidable. Uh, but there's nothing to be gained by being gloomy about this. And what we now have to do is to seize this remarkable moment where we've moved into the realization that we have to act and people actually now are beginning to step up and do it, including uh, some governments, including the British government, which has now put nature recovery uh, as a central aim uh, of policy alongside net zero, going low carbon and high nature at the same time. And I think now the rest of society, uh, you know, not only government, but institutions in the private sector, in the public sector and individuals, we now need to all get very serious about this. And when it comes to higher education, a few things that I've seen over the years, which now, you know, evidently uh, are becoming more important still, uh, which, you know, the sector could focus on. And so for higher education, you know, those estates of buildings and land, an incredible opportunity to go low carbon and high nature on all of that with some good practice now coming through. Actually just walking up the road here in Cambridge the other day, walking past a new building that's been built by Clare College, they put Swift nest boxes into the fabric of the building and I saw Swifts going in there and this is the first year that building has been open. So a great success story just by a bit of imagination being used by the architects as they design that building plenty more to do around the estates of Cambridge, I have to say, with biodiversity opportunities there going begging. But at least the discussion has begun. Low carbon uh, electricity, looking at the food supply coming into the university. Every organisation could be doing this. Higher education really getting serious about the estates now has to be a priority. And then, of course, the invested assets, the pension funds, been great student campaigns on those subjects now for a few years with universities including Cambridge moving very quickly now to decarbonize their assets uh, and I would hope also to be putting the regeneration and the recovery of nature alongside their low carbon ambitions in that respect and then of course there's the core business the teaching and uh, the extent to which we're equipping students now with the professional capabilities and insights, whether it's in philosophy or in economics, never mind in the core subjects of engineering and architecture, to be going out and delivering that high nature and low carbon world. Do we have the courses to do that? And I think in some cases, probably no, we don't. We do need to start modernizing to make sustainability the core theme of all of the purpose of the teaching, not something that's an add-on. Someone said that a moment ago. And then the research side, of course, the other core business of, of universities, lining up the research agenda, multidisciplinary, over the horizon, future proofing society with new ideas that are backed up by data and evidence. And so, you know, those are the opportunities. And I think if sustainability is not now the core purpose of higher education everywhere, I'm not sure what is. Uh, but at least now uh, we've got to the point where pretty much everybody agrees that this is what we need to be doing. Couldn't be more excited about the possibilities, Nick, and I wish you and the work that you're doing with your networks um, every possible success because the higher education side of 
of this is, is central to the success of everything else. Thanks very much. Thanks, Tony. I always love hearing you speak because you never shy away from the scale of the problem, but also have lots of positive, constructive uh, uh, answers and solutions uh, to tackling it. So thank you for that. Um, so our final uh, speaker from this bit of the morning, before we move to the Q&A and do keep those questions uh, coming in, uh, is Eunice, uh, Eunice um, Simmons from uh, the University of Chester. Many of you will know she's vice chancellor there and many of you will have come across her uh, in her previous senior roles in the sector, including as deputy VC at uh, Nottingham Trent, where she was in charge of the academic and student affairs directorate. Um, like uh, other speakers this morning, her own uh, disciplinary background is highly relevant. Her PhD was in forest ecology and conservation, and her professorship uh, is in sustainable environments. Um, uh, and it was looking at environmental teaching and research on ecosystems ranging from rainforest to downland. Um, and she is a member both of the board of Advance HE and also perhaps more relevant uh, specifically for this morning, the Environmental Association of Universities and Colleges, the EAUC. Um, so uh, over to you. Thank you very much for that introduction, Nick, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. So I thought uh, the contributions so far have, have really uh, set the scene for us. I just want to give you a few more examples of the particular institutional approach that we're taking. Um, I thought Kerry's hierarchy was very helpful. It illustrated the need for different stages in our response to the climate challenge, which plays to Tony's point about who is engaged within the university in a way who's ready to step up and get involved. So it's not just our geography and environmental students and academics, it's got to be beyond. And I was pleased to see actually on the delegates list that there are governors also present today. And I think that's pretty important. So the hierarchy goes from that sort of headline on optimizing the practical actions to structure reinvigorating our civic role, and then the world view. And finishing with a foundational narrative, I think was the expression Kerry used. And in a, um, a sense at Chester, we've started with that because we too, uh, like Reading, have developed a new strategy and we've entitled it Citizen Student because we believe it is that individual response to climate change and to our, uh, our place in communities, which really will speak to our students. So sustainability is a key theme, but so is the, the individual sort of, becoming cognizant of that and growing into it if you like. ESD will become integrated more than it is across subject areas as diverse as law and mathematics etc and I'm used to doing that at NTU as um, Nick mentioned we did a huge piece of work in this space. Um, but don't forget when you think about individual students think about uh, I think again what Kerry talked about emotional and psychological impact of living in this period so living in an era of climate change and one that is coming out of a pandemic. Those two really just um, happening together mean that we need to think very, very hard about the individual support for students and the group support and our ongoing commitment to these students. So following through some of the practical actions in the first stage um, that Kerry was highlighting, uh, we have used every opportunity for widespread education through the environmental initiatives. You need to go much broader than your environmental subjects. We've also, like Reading, uh, reduced our tons of CO2, in our case from 19,000 to 11,500 since 2014-15, and that was pre my arriving mostly at, at Chester. So I asked how it had been done. It was, um, for example, more system controls, environmental improvements, changing building use. Um, low carbon alternatives. We've only got very modest on site um, generation. So we've got a small uh, solar photovoltaics um, array, for example. I'm looking for much more. We've got a 100% renewable energy uh, contract uh, with Rego certification. Now we need to think about, as a university sector, making sure that all of those certification schemes are really valid and they're robust. Um, we're also doing well with waste recycling, um, with water reduction, for example, because that's also got a carbon footprint that's pretty significant. Um, and these are, you know, these are significant in ESG. But more than those, we are looking at our activities. So we are at the start of a wholesale review. 
to look at what being at Chester, what the university, what it's all about. It's a massive opportunity for ESG. So we're moving on campus away from personal space to a gradation of spaces from private interactive presentation, etc. And we're concentrating on that gradient of use and gradient of activity and interactivity. And we're looking hard at the reasons for students and staff to come onto campus. So many professional services will stay working from home, but will be facilitated to come in for you know, really positive gatherings and reasons uh, to actually be in the same uh, room. So we're looking hard at spaces that can um, add value. Um, we're looking for part time and commuting students to you know, work with us on the best experience for them and what we can do environmentally to make sure that their travel is lessened, their experience is greater. And we're looking at all sorts of framings for this. So science based targets, for example, and EAUC, Professor John French is working really hard um, to get uh, an approach to this that's relevant to universities, working with WWF who initiated this. So using evidence base for us carbon budgeting, we had a little go at this with, uh, for example, a hall of residence, which I was very keen to knock down because they were old 1970s blocks. But when we actually did the sort of carbon and uh, sustainability impact, it was better to repurpose them. So they're now all individual bookable spaces with beautiful green walls, which cover up some of the less appealing architecture. And actually that was a very sensible thing to do, but because we're now focusing all our thinking through the sustainability lens, it was much easier to make that decision and convince um, those that needed to be convincing. So we've also got a net zero target by 2030. And I interrogated this a bit to see how realistic it is. If we did nothing with our technology, our heating systems, our control systems, and wanted to get down to you know, the penultimate target of 1900 CO2E, it would mean using only half of one of our existing teaching sites. So we'd go from 120,000 meters squared down to 30,000 across the whole of Chester, and that's half of our main campus. That really focused my mind, and it also comes with a significant price tag. So if we had to spend, for example, I think our lead engineer said it was something like 450 to 500 pounds per CO2 equivalent tonne, over the next 10 years, and remember this is just for scope one and two emissions, our direct emissions within our control, it would cost us between 40 to 60 million. So that's huge. So everyone's saying they're gonna to get to net zero by 2030. I hope you've added up the millions you're gonna need. And as I say, without scope three, and that's pretty significant. I mean, scope three are often the largest impact that you have with your business model. So it isn't affordable. We're going to have to do a heck of a lot more in this space in terms of technology and changing our uh, pattern of use. And lastly, Tony mentioned research. I think the university sector needs to be much more assertive in promoting research and knowledge exchange in this area. So just three quick examples from Chester. Uh, we are a key member of the Hynek Consortium as our science park is adjacent to the SR oil refinery. They're planning to um, generate a lot of hydrogen produce it there and we'll host a facility to test um, equipment and new appliances using a, a mix of natural gas and hydrogen. The intention is to add hydrogen to the existing gas network. Really exciting. Joe Howe, um, our professor is uh, leading from our side on that and Kirsty Simpson from the business school working with Harriet Watt on the skills needed. So that's another role universities need to play is making sure that there are green skills um, uh, available in the, in the workforce. Another um, project with international partners in Greece and Georgia includes organic solar cells, which are flexible. They're going to outcompete silicon within the decade. So within our 2030 timeframe, yeah, and they can be used for wrapping around buildings or car roofs or indeed wearing. So I'm really interested in those. And another industry leader at Chester, Professor Council, has just completed a project called RISE. Is um, on all electric hybrid heat pumps. And these are heat pumps with energy storage and working with Durham, the EPSRC project, trialing um, seasonal solar energy storage. So getting uh, through one of those business issues about uh, the availability, evening out energy availability. Um, David talked about the, out, in the outset about the surge of interest in this area from the private sector. So for research in universities, we just need to speed up, get it out there and collaborate better our tendency to compete just needs to be overtaken by the overwhelming need to collaborate. Maybe that needs to be incentivized, but we all know that we should do it. 
So I'm going to leave it there because I can see some really interesting questions cropping up. Thanks very much, Nick. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you. And um, there's some really interesting details there. Um, and I'm going to go with no further ado to those questions, because there are lots of interesting questions coming in. I think I'll take them in groups of three. And because I'm keen to get through as many questions as possible, please don't feel if you're one of the panellists, you have to answer every question. Uh, uh, focus on the ones you would like to focus on. Um, let's go uh, in the order that they appear in the Q&A. Um, so we're going to start with Simon Kemp from the University of Southampton, who's got a question very uh, much aimed at David. Uh, David Willock, our first speaker. Um, can we turn Simon's uh, microphone on? Let's see if the technology uh, works for this, and then he can ask his own question. Simon, over to you. I can see you on my screen, but you're currently... Right, speaking. I've unmuted. Can you hear me okay? We can, perfectly. Okay, thank you. Um, so, um, thank you to all the panellists. I uh, thought all the contributions were fascinating. Um, and it, it's always difficult to use the term enjoyable when you're talking about the challenge that we're facing. Um, but hopefully you know what I mean in that. It was interesting. Um, so, this is a specific question about how we actually embed sustainability into particular areas. And I was looking at it from the perspective of Lloyd's initially. So, I'd be intrigued as to how you're actually working with higher education institutions so we can ensure the sustainability is included across curricula not just environmentally themed degrees but making sure that you're actually engaging with those core areas of accountancy management economics where the changes really need to be made um, so it becomes part of the normal business practice becomes part of the normal curriculum rather than an add-on and also how that then feeds into your graduate recruitment schemes. Do you actually um, specify the students need to have an understanding of sustainability in the context of banking and investment? Because you can lead some real change there. Thank you, Simon. We'll put that to David in a moment. Let's go to another David, David Loudon. Um, uh, oh, actually, David's question was just, will the presentations be made available? We'll certainly try to make them available, David. Uh, and so we'll go to the third question, uh, Rika, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, Rika Yadav, can we turn his or her microphone on? Great, Rika, hi, I'm, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, I apologise if I'm not. I think you're... Yeah, hi, uh, a very uh, good evening to all, I'm here from India and uh, Yes, this is Richard. Hi, hi. Do go ahead with your question. Great to have yeah, you. so so uh, uh, I'm from India, so we being a developing country. So I just wanted to know, like, uh, it was wonderful to hear the all the initiatives which are being taken. And um, but uh, do you think that as a developing country, the initiatives which are being taken by the developed country? Would it fit us in the same way as it does with you? Because we are a country where the population is huge and we, we are undergoing development. We have not reached the development stage as all the developed countries have. So uh, what, what strategy we could follow as a developing country? Thank you, Richard. A very important uh, question. It's fantastic to have people from all over the world uh, listening in. I'm going to go uh, to our third question, um, which is actually Diana Lauriard, which is marked as answered, but I think it's worth bringing it into the wider conversation. Uh, Diana, uh, who is a great expert on uh, pedagogy. Diana. Oh, I could see you and then you disappeared again. Can we turn Diana's microphone on? Unmute. I can see you, but you're currently left muted. Uh, we'll have one last go. Unmute. There we are. Fantastic. We can now hear you. You okay. can now hear me. Yes, <laughs> I kept clicking it and it kept telling me the host was muting it. Okay, well, yes, this, this question was prompted by, um, I like very much um, uh, Kerry's uh, analysis 
about what universities can be doing. And one of the main things that universities do is research. And the other main thing we do is teach. And we've got here a very large scale problem. So my question was really about, can we look at the way in which we universities can be promulgating their research findings to all the professionals who need to be rethinking the way they're doing their professional work. And that can be at many different levels of an organization or an industry or a business area. Um, we do know how to do MOOCs to some extent. Um, I would always call them massive open online collaborations when we're talking about professional education because you get so much from all the other professionals. So I, I just wondered if we could bring that sort of thing into the mix because we can do far more than we're currently doing at the moment. And it is a huge problem of professional development. Uh, thank you. I, I'm gonna go back to our panelists now. I'll ask them to keep uh, comments relatively brief because I'd like to have at least two more rounds of, of, of questions if we can. Let's go to David from Lloyd's first because the first question is very much aimed at you. Yeah, so I'm just gonna um, cover a couple of bullet points in response to that. So uh, I think the best practice is already out there. So there are some universities that you know I've met with and spoke to that are looking at embedding sustainability modules across all academic you know, genres and uh, courses. So, um, and I think that's you know, for, for those institutions rather than the bank to kind of lead on. However, where we are seeing it start to become quite interesting in a financing context is there's a phenomenon at the moment around something called sustainability linked loans. And this is basically where uh, a company or institution can link their financing to, uh, as well as other requirements, sustainability linked KPIs. And actually, we are starting to see thematics like that start to come in. So levels of, you know, certain outcomes be you know, related to climate or sustainability. But the important topic is going back to the point I made about detail is making sure these are material and appropriate and stretching. And I think just to finish off on this one around what we're doing and you know, let, let's be realistic around talent. There's a generational uh, difference, I think, in terms of the view and the importance of some of these underlying matters. And you know, the, the war for talent is really significant actually in the private sector um, and particularly in, in finance. And what we're hearing is that we see it through you know, colleague engagement. Uh, these, these things really, really matter. So we really, have to engage with um, our colleagues, particularly junior and graduate colleagues, to make sure that um, they, they want to work in here because they're increasingly preferencing for organisations that prioritise these matters. Thanks, David. Let's go to Kerry. So um, responding to all of those, I love the idea of making all graduate training schemes um, require a sustainability component. I think that would very seriously encourage universities to think about how they're involving this in, in their practice. Um, the question around um, India and developing countries, I think that's a huge challenge. Um, the one thing I would say, though, is, is to recognise the knowledge that everybody in India already has about how to live well in sustainable ways. And there's, there's a huge debate about what constitutes developed and developing that I think is probably worth unpicking that sits underneath that question. Um, but my main response would be to Diana's uh, really fantastic suggestion around um, the creation of professional online learning communities. Um, I, this is a brilliant idea. Um, it feels to me that there's probably a huge enthusiasm and interest in that sort of thing amongst um, academics. The challenge that we have is that we need to ensure that university leaders, and I'm delighted that there are so many on this um, call, are able to respond to that enthusiasm with encouragement rather than a conversation about where it fits in existing programme structures, finance structures, and if anybody's going to make a profit out of it, because it's such short term thinking, that sort of response. So it feels to me that there is a huge possibility there. And I'll give you the parallel example, which is 25 years ago at Uppsala University, a bunch of students went to their vice chancellor and said, nobody's teaching us anything about the world and what's important and how we, how we do it. Um, so he gave them funding to establish a new course um, and a new institute called CMUS which has since educated one in 500 people in Sweden, um, has had a huge impact on the entire Swedish attitude towards environmental change. So I think the, the mechanisms are there, as you've said, Diana, with the, with the MOOCs. I think the student enthusiasm is there and the academic enthusiasm is there. What we need to do is ensure that there is really serious support from university leadership when people come up and propose these sorts of suggestions. 
Thank you, Kerry. Let's go to Mark. Thanks. And I, 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 I'm, I'm sort of only slightly tongue in cheek. Uh, you, I think you'll find it hard to find a university leader who won't think about money as they go along, especially at the moment. Um, but at the same time, I think what's really quite just exciting is just looking at university leadership across the sector and seeing how many people are engaging with this as a challenge. But that, that's that's sort of by the by. Coming back to the questions, I think that you know education for sustainability is certainly becoming embedded and most most universities are talking about it if they're not actually doing it already particularly for their undergraduate students uh, we need to go beyond that i think we need to develop similar programs for our staff we also need to consider how we develop our own teachers and and how teacher training works and whether there's issues around that and the education side of it i think really comes back to risha's question as well because th there is this real challenge for for universities um, out, outside of the, 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 the richer parts of the, of, of the globe, where just quite simply the investment in the university infrastructure and, and, and sector is not what it needs to be for those local communities. It's difficult to make some of the changes we're talking about here. It is a massive, as Eunice said, it's a massive investment. We've done the same calculation, is, is all I'm saying, but we're committed to doing it despite that. Um, but I think the big change is around education. It's about engaging people with the need for change and and you can do that at every level whether you happen to be in india or brazil or in the uk or in the us that it's important everywhere that, that we engage with that thank you uh, mark and i will give another plug to kerry's happy report because it is does very much have an international uh, flavor to many of the case studies for example in there um tony over to you Thanks, Nick. I, I, I'm just just reflecting on on some of the points that Richard made about the um, the development context of of countries and the extent to which you know there is this sense that in some parts of the world where you know there's a large population living in poverty that there is a phase of catching up still to be done to to get to the same level of development as the West uh, before embarking on the the journey to to sustainability. And this has been possibly the biggest environmental dilemma that, that's been there, certainly in the global picture since the beginning. And, you know, you see this at the Earth Summit in 92, the environment development kind of clash. And it, it is a really big one, but I think if there is an answer to it, um, it's about the question of whether it will be possible for countries like India to get to a high level of social well-being and food and energy security and comfort and health care and all the things that people take for granted in the West, whether it will be possible to get to the stage of being able to do that for 1.4 billion people in that country um, at the same time as, as eliminating the environmental impact. It's really a question of can you leapfrog those dirty stages of development that characterise the Western journey to our present uh, development state and to do it in a clean way instead and and so to to leapfrog past you know the 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 the, the massive growth in fossil fuels by going for a massive growth in clean energy technology instead and you know the economics of that are now catching up and you know to the point today where it is now cheaper to invest in large scale um renewables rather than large scale fossil and i I do wonder if the academic community in India and the research community uh, would be in a position to be able to shape that narrative, uh, because the narrative that has been there hitherto has been one of injustice. And it's true up to a very large level uh, that, you know, the West has benefited from unsustainable development. Uh, but then is the reaction to that to say, well, it's our turn to do unsustainable development, or is it more sensible to say, actually, it's our turn to leapfrog your stupidity and to do something much smarter. And a lot of that kind of thinking does come from the, the world of the academics and the thinkers. And so I wonder, Richard, if, if you know, that there, there is another dimension to this discussion about development, which, which adds something new, uh, which is about how countries can do better than the West, rather than saying it's our turn to do what the West did, if you see what I mean. Uh, thanks, Tony. And then uh, finally, in this round, Eunice. Yes, and interestingly, I had a recent meeting.
meeting with the uh, Indian consulate uh, in Birmingham, and they were very much thinking about business and universities in the UK and in, in Indian businesses and universities sort of twinning together to do exactly what Tony is talking about, to do this leapfrogging. So I think there's an open door there. We just need to push perhaps a bit harder as the UK HEA in that space. And then on the, um, on the online, uh, EAUC has, has got quite a lot of uh, products in this area. They've got an emerging leaders course, for example, and a leadership academy, which is actually oversubscribed. So they're running it again in the autumn which is brilliant. And then there's carbon literacy training, obviously different um, institutions can get carbon literacy trainers and then push out training through their own organizations or networks. And then don't forget, we've talked a bit about estates and there's some estates professionals on the call. So Ord and EAUC are working together on a new sustainability scorecard, which again will be an online product as well in terms of an integrating reporting tool, but it'll have a lot of educational sort of spin out to it as well. There's quite a lot going on in this space. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to move back to the uh, questions now. Uh, uh, the first one from uh, our former colleague here at Happy Diana Beach, who now runs London uh, Higher. Diana. Thank you very much, Nick. Is this working? Yes. Uh, thank you. And thank you to all the panellists for insightful contributions. Um, as Nick said, I'm from London Higher. We represent over 40 uh, universities and higher education colleges across London. And I'm just wondering if you'd agree with the sense that universities in large cities like London, also known as the Big Smoke, um, have a longer way to go to get their sustainability efforts recognised. And that's despite many of them already having ambitious sustainability pledges in place. Um, are they less likely to be looked to for a sort of clean green leadership because of their big city surroundings and perceptions that they can't ever be truly green? And the reason I ask this is no criticism of this event, but sort of since I've been at London Higher, I notice a distinct lack of London around the thought leadership table when it comes to sustainability. And of course, the same is true for mm -hmm. other sort of post-industrial northern towns as well. And I'm wondering what we can do to combat this. Thank uh, you. Thank you, Diana. Um, I'm going to go. Um, to Alistair Moffat now. Um, uh, I'm going to try for now to stick with people who haven't uh, asked a question yet. Al Alistair, very uh, crisp question, particularly aimed at Lloyds. Hopefully we can turn Alistair's microphone on. If not, uh, his question's a crisp question in the Q&A. Uh, which is just, has Lloyd's Bank made any significant direct investment into carbon capture technology? So question for you, David. Um, we then uh, got uh, an anonymous question, which I think is quite important. So I'll read it out. If part of the carbon savings is down to staff working from home, can universities include the carbon footprint of those homes as well? Otherwise, those savings are not real. Um, a, a, a question about staff working, very topical with um, COVID. And then I think we'll go, uh, let's see if we can turn on Heather, Heather Eggings' uh, microphone, uh, which is also a question about staff. Heather, over to you. Yes, thank you for a very interesting uh, um, webinar. Um, you mentioned that several points um, matters that impact on the academic profession. Um, the curriculum has been mentioned, uh, campus design has been mentioned, um, also training of staff has been mentioned. Um, how do you see these range of new developments impacting on the academic profession as a whole and what new skills will we as academics need to develop? Thank you very much, Heather. Let's go back to the panel. I'd like to get at least one more round of questions in after this. So I'll ask you to be as crisp on this round as you were on the last round. And I might shake up the order a bit. So, uh, Tony, let's go to you first on this round. Thanks, Nick. I, I think maybe, maybe I just make a brief point um, uh, that came from the last question about the skills that the academics need. And um, I think probably that th this is, um, I mean, it varies from, from subject to subject, but I think being able to embed 
this sustainability context into all subjects now is really what what needs to occur um whether it's on the research side or, or on the teaching side and you know I, I mentioned philosophy a little bit earlier and you know th that is one area where you know you could have a very productive academic um curriculum which is around you know the the, the some of the big dilemmas that lie behind all of these sustainability challenges like the world view for example that has built over the last three centuries which basically leads us all to conclude that we're somehow separated from the natural world and that our economy and our political system can go along as if it was completely detached from the realities of how ecosystems work i mean that's that's a, a question that is rarely debated i don't know of any university that talks about that uh, but it could do and it's one of the most important questions uh, that faces us at the moment why is it that we think like that and certainly a question for philosophers and you know similarly profound questions in economics you know how do we move beyond growth free market economics to deliver sustainability uh in you know some of the other subjects where you can see um you know more uh, uh of a direct connection so in botany and you know some of the natural sciences in, in terms of how we swiftly move to a regenerative agricultural system i mean all this stuff is still so fringe from what I see uh, in terms of how uh, teaching is done. And I think, you know, if the academics can reskill to bring this stuff center stage, I think probably that would be my top priority. Thanks, Tony. Uh, Eunice, let's go to you next. Yes, uh, in terms of uh, whether we are in off siting I would call it, our carbon emissions, like pushing our carbon emissions into scope three that are generated in staff housing. I think that's really interesting. And we've started to think what percentage it might be of their particular emissions. And goodness, wouldn't that be interesting to get all staff to start thinking about their own carbon footprint at home and then what percentage might be relevant to their work. I'm sure we should do something in this space because otherwise we're just sort of pushing responsibility elsewhere. Um, so we'll certainly be budgeting for that. And then it, Heather's question about about what do academics need to do differently. I think I would say that they're all, regardless of discipline, going to need to work across discipline and be more multidisciplinary. I think that's good for their students. I think there needs to be good examples of that within all courses, to be honest. And that's, I hope, where we're heading. But also, the boring bit, processes. Think about processes and engaging with professional services, because a lot of the improvements in what we can do environmentally as a university is thinking about those traditional ways of doing things and try and make them smarter. Uh, thank you, Eunice. Mark. There we go. Um, they're really good questions. At home working, we did an analysis of that at Reading, and I don't have the I, I did a quick search to see if I could find the message that told me that, you know, what the difference was. But essentially, by people working at home, it certainly cut down in carbon emissions, not just because of travel, but because people's homes seem to be better insulated than the university buildings are. Um, so, so there was the, the, there was that, even though what we can't do is, 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 you know, push responsibility away. I want to be absolutely clear about that. Uh, the second question about changes for uh, how academics work I, I i think the really obvious one is that how how we travel how we meet each other how we work together as 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 a somebody who's an ecologist i've traveled the world it's going to be a lot less than it, it certainly used to be in the in the past conferences reduced this kind of way of working works and so i think that there, there'll be certainly something learned from from covid because of that and this First question around um, the, the sort of more metropolitan institutions and perhaps they're not getting the recognition they deserve. I thought that was a really interesting question. So I quickly went and looked up um, the first league, league table I could come to, which is the people and planet one. And really high up in that are places like City and the LSE. King's is, is pretty high as well. Um, just sort of thinking of London universities. But I guess what's the reality we face is that if you're an intensive science-based institution, it's really difficult to meet some of these challenges because you're a bigger energy user. That That's just the reality we face uh, on, a, on a daily basis, I'm afraid. Thanks, Mark. Uh, Kerry. Um, <clears throat> so going to Diana's question on cities, 
cities are going to be absolutely key to viable living over the next um, 50 years. If we can't figure out how to live well in cities, we will not achieve these goals. So it's absolutely clear that city universities have a role to play. I think, you, you know, city universities, if they're not getting as much visibility, they have to ask themselves why. I mean, I think that, you know, step up, speak more clearly. Um, you can see what's going on at Boston and New York. I mean, their work, their city-based universities, and they're incredibly visible, the work that Harvard and others are doing in this sphere. So I, I think that's actually a responsibility for the, for the city universities themselves to take that lead. Um, in terms of the, uh, the kind of anonymous question on carbon savings with staff working from home, one of the things that I've been talking with my colleagues at Bristol about is how we support energy saving grants, particularly for low income uh, colleagues, um, particularly colleagues who are working in precarious uh, employment. How do we support them to work at home? Because there's actually also the ethical issue of offloading those costs onto staff that they didn't have before. And the final question about the kind of the academic profession as a whole, what does that mean? Um, I'd encourage Tony to notice the whole field of environmental humanities that's been developing for the last 10 years that absolutely puts these questions of the philosophy um, of uh, the kind of civilizational shifts that we're talking about at the center of their work. There's a huge amount of work looking at what does it mean to be human in these conditions? And what are the academic skills? I'd suggest the primary one is curiosity. So how do academics look beyond their particular disciplines and realize that we are facing a very, very interesting moment of change and figure out how they can build relationships with each other. If academics are going to do that though, we have to recognize the, the disincentives to that that are built into systems like REF and publishing that encourage provincial siloed thinking and that encourage us to reproduce our students as provincialized siloed thinkers and it is about time that we started looking at those structures so that they can encourage and reward academics who are looking beyond their disciplines to build partnerships to address these sorts of challenges. Thank you Kerry. Um, uh, David. Hi so I'm, I'm just going to primarily focus on the carbon capture question I've got a couple of other observations so on the carbon capture question specifically around investment. So last year, um, we allocated around 2 billion of our Scottish widows uh, equity uh, towards a BlackRock managed climate fund. So that's it, those kind of purposes would be captured within that fund, but that's on the equity side. On the debt side, which is what we do a lot uh, within Lloyds Bank, uh, we've got a 5 billion discounted lending program, which is a use of proceeds program, which focuses on qualifying green purposes. So this is where a particular activity and use of proceeds is used in a certain qualifying way. However, what I would say about emerging technologies is these kind of lending propositions aren't detached away from the normal credit process. And what actually sometimes you find is actually emerging technologies sometimes struggle a little bit on the, the credit side. However, the good news is the global equity markets, and I speak to asset managers from across the world, you know, not just in the UK, but um, Asia and America, and, and the, the, there is almost insatiable equity capital available for these clean technologies. So uh, that's, I think that's encouraging that the, both the equity markets and where possible the debt markets are there to support. Uh, and that talks to the TCFD sort of opportunities and risks. You know, obviously there's lots of risk, but there's also lots of opportunities to this transition as well. And we're starting to see that play out. Um, estates whenever you want to talk about estates uh, in these q a's let me know i'm a real estate financier by background so i can talk a lot about a different estate strategy and look it's expensive it's complicated uh, and you've got to get your data right and, and one one thing would be looking at whole life carbon it's super important to look at whole life carbon when you're looking at the built environment because that's the end game and finally for the question around noticing London universities uh, from a financial markets context, I, I've certainly noticed because both UCL and Kings have access to the debt capital markets in green formats. Uh, and that is noteworthy. So people are, some people are definitely noticing, including me. Thank you, David. So we only have 10 minutes left. We are, we must finish on time because uh, we'll lose our audience and uh, it will be lunchtime as well. So um, what I'm going to do, and this is going to be quite a challenge, I'm going to ask three more people to pose their questions and I'm going to go back to the panel and they can choose which of those they respond to. And also it will be their chance to make any final remarks they may want to make. And we've only got 10 minutes to do all of that. So no further ado, I'm going to go to Simon Baker. Uh, who, if it's a Simon Baker, I think it is, is a journalist of the Times Higher. Simon. Hi, Nick. Hopefully you can hear me. 
we can. Yeah, good. Okay, uh, I'll be as quick as I can. Um, it was I was very interested in Kerry's points about the role universities can can both potentially make in retraining vast numbers of people in low carbon industries, and that comes at a time it seems a, a good time when that's being thought about anyway because of the pandemic and and how universities how how do universities make sure they're at the forefront of that um, and don't get sidelined by the growth in kind of no um, short courses by private providers, coding camps, that, that kind of thing. Um, and in fact, should universities be doing that anyway? Should they be, should they be concentrating on um, degrees that prepare uh, students for a lifetime of work anyway? Thanks, Simon. Um, I'm going to go to Rosie Pierce now, who's asked two questions. I think, Rosie, your first question is probably uh, the one to uh, stick with, if you can. Okay, um, so I wanted to ask about research funding. Um, so um, the UK is hoping to be part of Horizon Europe, um, even though we're leaving the EU. Um, should we ask for um, higher technology to be funded, so technology that's closer to being brought to market, or should we be um, asking for more funding that's um, aligned to um, a more blue sky thinking? Thank you, Rosie. I uh, uh, love the picture of your dog there. I don't know if everyone can see that, but I can. Um, and then I'm going to actually go to an anonymous question. I'm sorry we haven't got time to go to all the questions, but I think it's a really important anonymous question here, which is um, how can internationalization fit into the future of sustainable universities? If you've got 100,000 plus international students flying to the UK, burning carbon and bringing money, uh, how can universities manage the transition? So, of course, we are incredibly reliant on international students, and it's a very important question. I'm going to go to the reverse order to how uh, um, we started. So, um, uh, Eunice first. Yeah, briefly on internationalization, you're not wrong. Um, we could go straight for offsets, but offset uh, projects themselves uh, are problematic if they're not validated sufficiently. I think I would say internationalization strategies have to be about in-country education as well and reducing movement, um, making it as effective as possible when it happens, um, but potentially reducing it. And obviously this pandemic has shown lots of international students have worked very well without traveling to the UK and having that full experience. So it actually you know, is a possibility for more distance learning. India, for example, has accepted distance learning for the first time ever as a funded route. Um, and briefly on one, one of the other questions, which was about research funding, it's both, it's close to market and blue skies. And then you said I could have my last comment, which is don't forget that civic role, which actually was picked up in Kerry's report. We're working really hard with our lead local authority, one of several we work with, but they were charging ahead with a carbon plan without us, and yet they need us to achieve it. So we've got to work together in partnership. Thank you very uh, much, Ines. Uh, of course, that's the problem with tackling this whole question. So many different aspects, including our civic university role, uh, need to come into the conversation. Tony, final word over for, 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 for you from you. Uh, th th thank you, Nick. Just on that internationalization uh, point. Yeah, that's right, isn't it? Lots of people flying all over the place is um, very 20th century in terms of, of how we have to look at the these carbon issues. Um, but I wouldn't say that, you know, uh, the, um, the, the, the travel is, 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 is not worth the, the outcome. You know, these are global problems. They're going to require global solutions and a level of global understanding uh, that is going to have to be invested in more as we go forward. And we can do a lot of this stuff now through digital technologies like we're doing today. Uh, but I do think that some of the carbon we expend on bringing people together in different countries actually is worth it. Uh, and so I, I wouldn't necessarily see this as automatically bad. I mean, we, we have to minimize the impact of it and you know, looking at offsetting and some of these things and minimize the use of it. Uh, but nonetheless, I do think it's an essential part of the solution is gonna be bringing people together across national borders, physically as well as digitally. Uh, on, the, on the market ready or blue skies, um, well, the university sector it probably is the place where we're mainly going to get the blue skies stuff done. 
Um, some of the things that are closer to market, the private sector will invest in research and development there, probably, you know, in partnership with, with universities and what have you. Uh, but the stuff that we still need to invent that's not invented yet, um, I think the universities obviously have a particularly important role there. Uh, so would emphasize that alongside, you know, saying it's not either or. Final remark from me. Uh, this year has two major summits on COP15 on biodiversity hosted by China, COP26 hosted by the UK on climate change. Um, in terms of the UK being a leader uh, on both of these subjects, you know, the, the, the bits of the UK that are, you know, prominent in the global scene, I think are particularly important in being able to demonstrate global leadership, actually come, comes back to that bit about internationalization a moment ago. So the more we can connect us doing great things in our higher education sector with then being able to show that the UK is serious about this on the global stage. I think there's a particularly important role there, given the prominence of, of our universities in, in the world. Thanks, Nick. Uh, thank you, Tony. Uh, Mark, over to you. Thanks, and uh, I'll be brief, but I'd say in funding, I think when it comes to climate change, it's it's difficult to see the, the, the cut between blue skies and then the impactfulness of it, whatever you're doing at the end of it. And if I think of our own um, research into, into climate change, we have a very large group of, of world leading climate change uh, scientists at Reading. And for them, you know, a lot of their work is not just about predicting where the world is going to change, how it's going to change, but it's then applying that to things like flooding, to fire, to agricultural change and so on, uh, to, to allow ad adaptation or, or mitigation where, where possible. What I'd really like to focus on is, is the international question. It's a really, really good one. And it's something I've absolutely struggled with um, for, for the last couple of years. And I think ultimately, you know, I, I, I agree with Tony. I think the, the, the need for people to travel doesn't stop. Wh whether we have the same rate of travel or, or not is the thing that perhaps changes. Um, there's a huge amount of soft power and influence that comes from having students come to the, to the UK that we shouldn't forget about. Uh, but I think universities have to own that. That's part of their operating carbon budget, and they have to come up with the solution and not expect the students themselves who are traveling to, to, to do that, I feel. Uh, so if I'm going to end on anything, it is about internationalization. It is that link that the uh, UK universities have globally in terms of helping uh, come to grips with the climate crisis. Thank you, uh, Mark. Kerry. Oh, so much to finish on. Um, on internationalization, I think we need to remember that we are in partnership. It was quite possible to be an academic in the many, many years before there was air travel. People wrote letters to each other. I'm not advocating that. My point is, is that we've got very obsessed with the idea of air miles being a sim symbol of kind of academic importance, which is utterly crazy. Um, we at uh, Bristol have been running a very successful doctoral program in partnership with the university in Hong Kong for the last 20 years. Partnership and collaboration is what will take us forward in this area. Um, on research funding, yes, um, I would suggest that it's not this blue skies are applied because if we do blue skies thinking, we also have to experiment. So it's not that these two things are separate from each other. Our job is to demand funding that helps us rethink a civilization. That's what we need. It's not this old conversation, blue skies or hands on. In terms of universities, um, and the green skills agenda, Simon. I mean, the critical thing to me is that we need to rethink who our students are, okay? So we've got this obsession with 18 to 21 year olds. This is total nonsense. It makes no sense whatsoever. We need to rethink universities as part of the broader adult education uh, priority in this country and to, to really build some alliances with the Adult Education Commission who are trying to shift us away from this very short-termist and frankly myopic approach to education we have in this country, which suggests that if you don't succeed at the particular age that you're supposed to succeed at, then that's the only chance that you've got. We have to get over this ridiculous idea that education is a treadmill and a race that only has one speed. Adult education is central to the UK's capacity to adapt to change. And I think I'll finish with the final point, which is that the critical issue for all of us here is to stop thinking of universities as institutions. We all do it. We all promote our own institutions. This is not going to get us through this. We have to recognize that 
universities are part of our critical learning infrastructure for the country. If we do not have a critical learning infrastructure, we will not learn, we will not produce the knowledge, we will not produce the things that we need in order to be able to make these changes. So we absolutely have to shift beyond an individualistic, business-focused, competitive approach to recapture universities as central to the country's capacity to adapt and respond to change. And that needs some very fundamental questions, including how we're funding our universities. Thank you, Kerry. Uh, David, the final word in this final set of remarks, over to you. Thank you, Nick. And look, th thanks for having me. So it's been really fascinating. I've learned a lot from listening to the questions and um, the other panelists. And, and I think I'll just reiterate what I said at the start. Um, we need to capitalise on this, this peak of interest in the private sector and ensure that some of these good intentions are backed up by the detail. And, and we've heard today, you know, the academic community has that detail, as Tony said, for many decades in some cases. So I just reiterate, you know, we're very much uh, centred on this topic uh, and look forward to brokering and taking part in collaboration to help address some of these challenges and opportunities. So that's it for me. Thanks, Nick. Thanks all. Well, thank you, David. And along with your commitment to continuing to do more work in this space, Happy is also committed to that. And we would love to hear from anybody who wants to write for us uh, on these issues. I think today we've covered such a lot of ground, but there's a lot more ground to cover. And I'm going to end now because it is one o'clock by thanking uh, all of our speakers, uh, by thanking uh, Lloyds Bank for being the co-hosts uh, of this event, including people who you can't see on your screen. Kim and Andrew and, and my colleagues are happy as well, who've done some of the back office work getting this event off the ground, uh, Emma, Lucy, uh, Rachel uh, in particular. And um, thank you to all the speakers. Thank you to everyone for staying with it. I know there are lots of questions we didn't get to. We will capture and record those Q&A and do email us if you'd like to continue the conversation. We might even put those emails to the, to, to, to the speakers. Um, I'm going to call it to a halt there so everyone can go and get lunch uh, in this on this sunny day. Um, thank you uh, once again. Uh, I couldn't have thought of a more important topic uh, to have been discussing this morning. Thank you. Goodbye.